My name is Ben Shenton. For the first 15 years of my life, I lived among members of a doomsday cult that believed with all their hearts that the world would be soon ending. Hidden away in our compound on the shores of Lake Eildon in Australia, we lived behind a wall of thick foliage and barbed wire, completely cut off from the outside world. Out of the six male children that resided in the compound, five of us were made to wear the same blue velvet uniform and bleached blonde hair. We looked almost identical. We would also take part in joint activities every morning, including yoga practice. But one morning in August of 1987, our world did indeed end, but not in the way our leaders had imagined. Up until that day, my entire world was shaped and controlled by Anne Hamilton Byrne, an intensely charismatic yogi who had founded the movement she called The Family. Officially, we were to be known as the Santini Ketton Park Association or the Great White Brotherhood, but among ourselves, we simply referred to each other as the family. Members believed that Anne was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ and that when the world ended, they would be responsible for re-educating the survivors. But that morning, after yoga practice, we children were horrified to find ourselves being gathered up by uniformed policemen. There was shouting, screaming, begging and crying, but nothing helped. We were soon whisked away from the five-acre compound into a new kind of world that would take me years to fully comprehend, the real world. The other children and I were told that Anne Hamilton Byrne was our mother, but the day-to-day -day job of raising us was left to other members of the cult's inner circle, women we called aunties. We woke up at 5 a.m. every single day in dormitory-style bunk beds and followed the exact same unchanged routine, yoga, meditation, education, homework, bed. A huge part of the education we received taught us to avoid outsiders at all costs. If anyone approached us, who we didn't recognize as being part of the family, we were told to follow the mantra of unseen, unheard, unknown. It was strictly forbidden to communicate with anyone we didn't know directly, lest we give away important family secrets to outsiders. We were only allowed to eat small vegetarian meals as Anne Hamilton Byrne had strictly forbidden all consumption of meat on the compound. Any rule breaking was met with brutal punishment. The aunties would sometimes hold our heads underwater if we were naughty, or if we were really bad, we'd be made to hold our hands over lit candles until they burned us. But that was nothing compared to the raw, naked fear we felt whenever Anne presided over our punishments. She would verbally berate us to the point of tears before beating us horribly with her stiletto heels. More than once her heels would break the skin. I'm pretty sure some of the other kids still have scars as a result of her punishments, both physical and mental. Another way Anne exerted control over us and the other cult members was through drugs. Us children were fed a steady diet of pills that we would only later discover were sedatives such as Valium or Mogadam. But the adults had it even worse. They and the older teenagers present were obligated to take part in regular ceremonies known as clearings. It was during these clearings that Anne forced the cult members to take large amounts of LSD before she essentially began to brainwash them, strengthening the family members' devotion to her and only her. I hated my childhood, but it was all I knew. Not only that, but my suffering was shared by all the other children. We all looked alike. We all talked alike. I was nothing special. The adults, led by Anne, created every aspect of our reality for us, we had absolutely no other points of reference, no competing narrative, but that all changed the day the police arrived. Lying in the bed of a child detention facility on my first night away from Eildon Compound, I went over everything I'd said to officials that day, wondering if I'd given anything away that could get me in trouble with Anne. It took me a while to really come to terms with the fact that us children would not be returning to Lake Eildon that the lives we'd been forced to lead didn't matter anymore. For the first time in my life, I realized I was free. But as the truth started to finally come out, it nearly broke me. I was not 15, as I had been repeatedly told. I was 14. I was given an extra year to my age because I had supposedly taken the place of a child that had died a year before I was born. I was treated as a replacement, a reincarnation of the deceased child's spirit. 
I learned that Anne was not my mother at all, that my real mum was one of the aunties by the name of Joy. This was incredibly confusing for me. I'd never liked Joy and she'd never shown me an ounce of love or affection. To think she was my biological mother was psychologically scarring in ways I can't really describe. It also came to light that the other boys and girls on the compound were not my siblings. Some were the children of other cult members, while others were simply orphans that the family had adopted through various agencies. Finally, and perhaps the most obvious revelation was that Anne Hamilton Byrne was not the reincarnation of Christ, nor did she possess any kind of supernatural abilities or foresight. She was just a woman, and a crazy one at that. I had suddenly and involuntarily come to a stage in my life where it was a case of, well, what now? What are the rules? How do I function? After hours and hours in the chair of a child psychologist, I was finally given the all clear to begin attending a regular Australian school. Needless to say, I struggled to fit in. Whenever any of the other kids tried to reach out to me, I would quickly push them away. I didn't understand why at the time, but Later I came to realize that it was because any children in the family that showed any signs of bonding were quickly separated. Friendship was something I had never experienced. But even if I had, to build friendships you need common ground, shared interests. I had none of that. As a result of the isolation, I had suffered and struggled with severe depression. But the people around me, especially the teachers, were extremely sympathetic to my situation the raid on Eildon compound and the subsequent arrest of the cult leaders was national news in Australia. Everyone knew our story. I remember a teacher telling me that adjusting to regular life would take time. She told me I'd have to learn how to relate to people. I took this advice to heart. Shortly after, I moved out of the children's home and into a foster home. The foster family I stayed with were churchgoers and I feel like this helped me adjust to regular life in ways other things couldn't. I began to feel increasingly at home. Eventually, I met a girl, got married and had two children, now aged 18 and 20. I've also held down a job over at IBM for almost 23 years now. I feel like the number one thing I need to get across to people is that no matter how terrible your childhood is, no matter what upheaval or chaos a person may suffer, it is never too late for them. With kind people, time and patience, I feel as though just about anyone can find it in themselves to get better, to readjust, to earn the happiness and peace that I feel everyone so richly deserves. My mom was always something of a latent hippie. She dreamed of backpacking around Europe and soaking up the culture. One day, when she was in Sweden on her way to buy a plane ticket for some new adventure, she met a man idling on a street corner, strumming a tune on a guitar. He told her of a man named Father David, the charismatic leader of the religious doomsday cult, offered the youth of her generation a purpose in life and a way to serve God without joining a church. He also spoke of living with a group of other followers. The man invited her over for dinner and she joined the cult known as the Children of God that night. My dad also had an adventurous streak, but also he harbored an insatiable lust for knowledge. He'd been the top of his geology class at UC Davis, but had dropped out just a month before graduation. In the run-up to him dropping out, he'd been in almost constant communication with his five older siblings. They told him how they were joining a religious organization the children of God, and were moving to Spain to be closer to other group members. My parents met in Spain shortly after they both had joined the children of God cult in 1978 and were soon married. Father David, the leader of the children of God, lived in hiding. Due to some controversial opinions regarding certain child disciplines and certain freedoms that he gave, he had been on the run from the law and was forced to obscure his true identity. From an unknown hideout, he passed down commands and teachings to his global following of almost 12,000 individuals. Father David also believed he needed to amass a large army to prepare the world for the coming apocalypse. 
In the mid-80s, he ordered his followers to escape from western homelands and head for developing countries in the east. This was because he believed that the decadent west would be the recipient of the worst of God's divine wrath. And so, I spent the majority of my childhood in Thailand, completely ignorant of the outside world. By the time I was a teenager, I had lived in more than 20 countries on three different continents. In Thailand, the gate separating our yard from the dirt road outside was completely boarded up with wood. In the afternoon, the children were allowed to go outside for one hour as long as we stayed within the perimeter of the walls. When no one was looking, I would press my nose against the metal bars of the gate and look out at the world that I wondered so much about. Wake-up call was at 7 every day and our room had to be immaculate by 7.30. We gathered ourselves into neat rows and stood to attention. We filed down the stairs and through the halls, just like little soldiers. As we marched, I often heard sounds coming from the narrow, screen-covered windows at the top of the halls. They were the sounds of women groaning and men breathing heavily. We were told that the adults, who we called uncle and auntie, were participating in God's love, and they were encouraged to do so continuously. Father David had wrestled with the constant conflict between his desires and his commitment to religion. With the children of God, he found a way to combine the two in an unholy union of spiritualism and pleasure of the flesh. But despite his predictions, the world didn't end in 1993. Instead, Father David claimed to receive yet another prophecy that told him it was time to move his followers back to the West. My family of 13 join at home with 30 other members in Chicago. What I noticed about life in the US was that the only protection we had from the outside world was a chain link fence, quite the difference from the fortress compound in Thailand. I also noticed how plentiful food seemed to be. When we woke up on our first morning in America we found a bowl of oranges on the dining room table. We were allowed to eat even if it wasn't meal time, even if we weren't hungry something I'd never experienced before. One morning in February of 95, we gathered in the living room of our home to celebrate Father David's birthday. We were told there would be a special announcement. I noticed that some of the adults had been acting a bit strange lately. Some of them seemed to have an unusual melancholy. There was a strange sensation of electricity buzzing in the air. Then came the words I never expected to hear. Our beloved Father in the Lord has gone to be with Jesus. Some of the adults immediately broke into tears. Uncle Tim, the house leader, said we discussed details of how the family would move forward without Father David by utilizing the Charter, a new book of rules that had been issued by Father David's wife. According to the Charter, adults could now live wherever they wished and with whom they wished, as long as they tithed 10% of their income to the leadership and continued to convert non-believers. Because of their newfound freedom, some of the adults were able to reach out to their families and relatives after years of silence. My dad found a small house just a few blocks from where we had initially settled. Another couple joined us in our new home. The adults told the children that they still wanted to be a part of the children of God and that they intended to follow the charter. Our goals might be different now without Father David's guidance, Mom said. We continued to try to keep the daily routine we'd followed when we lived communally in the Children of God's compound. There was a total of 11 kids in our family, plus the other couple's three children, and Mom divided up the chores amongst everyone. The women in the family took care of the children while Dad, my older brother, and Uncle Stephen were responsible for getting the money we needed for food and utilities by selling goods at local swap meets. After spending two very difficult years in Chicago trying to make ends meet with no savings, my family moved to California to live near my dad's sister. Stephen and Mary went to live with relatives in the Philippines. They finally had enough of living as a cult. No one in my family ever returned to the children of God, and none of us have any kind of contact with the community. Some of my siblings went on to pursue their degrees, some are working, while others succumbed to the path of drugs and alcohol like many children who grew up in the children of God did. I don't think I'll ever be able to fully explain what it's like to try to adjust to normal life after being raised in such abnormal circumstances. 
I know my childhood is something I can never return to or get back. So instead of focusing on the past, I have spent every day since I left the children of God choosing to focus on my future. Now, 20 years after finding freedom, I continue to be passionate about education, and I am currently pursuing a second graduate degree to become a college professor. Eventually, I want to work with the disadvantaged students in colleges and universities in hopes of helping them to find their own voices and think independently. After spending so much time as a prisoner of someone else's way of seeing the world, I can think of nothing more important. The Unification Church was a church founded on May 1st, 1954. Some of you may have heard of the church and how its members are often referred to as Moonies. Many members of the church are divided on that nickname. Many of us like it, but some consider it a kind of slur. The Unification Church and its teachings center around the founder, the Reverend Sun Myung Moon. We were taught that Moon, when he was a young boy in North Korea, was visited by Jesus Christ himself, who descended from the sky to inform the young Reverend Moon that it was his destiny to bring the people of Earth back to God. In order to achieve this end, Moon collected his thoughts into a book called The Divine Principle, which is used as a supplementary text by members. In order to accelerate the growth of the church, he arranged many marriages between members. My parents were matched using photographs of themselves. Moon literally picked up a picture of my mom and of my dad and matched them like that. In order to marry all the couples he matched, the church also arranged mass wedding ceremonies. I am a second generation member, though I know a handful of third generation members. I intend to leave the church officially when I reach 18 years of age. If I choose to stay, my parents would seek a girl in the church for me to marry and... With the consent of the girl's parents, I would be married off to that girl in a mass ceremony, along with thousands of other couples. My parents have no idea that I intend to leave the church and I don't know how they will react when they find out. To be honest though, I'm more worried about how they react to the fact that I've had a secret girlfriend for the past three years. I've been dreading the moment when they inevitably find out. The main text of the religion is the divine principle. The divine principle basically states that the core of humanity, the basic structure around which everything should focus, is the family unit. Another idea that is central to the unificationist philosophy is the idea of pure love. Pure love entails no dating of any kind before marriage, no sex before marriage, and no sex 40 days after marriage. Pure love also entailed that the founder of the church would be the one who matched the couples to ensure that the marriage was a pure one. In the first few matching ceremonies, he literally pointed pairs of people in a room and told them that they were to be married to each other. As the church grew, Moon began matching people by their pictures, and he eventually loosened up on this policy, and the church set up matching workshops for parents so that parents could do the matching in lieu of Moon's matching. It should be noted that Moon himself was married twice. We are generally taught the same things as Christians are taught, in addition to teachings specific to the Unification Church. We learn about Moon's struggles in North Korea, the moment when Jesus revealed himself to the Reverend, and the struggles of Moon in trying to get the church going in the 70s and 80s. One story that I was taught that always stuck with me was the story of how Moon, when in a North Korean prison, only ate half his allotted rice and gave the rest away. It shows how Moon built a cult of personality around himself, presenting himself as a Christ figure. He escaped the North Korean prison when the US bombed the prison he was in during the Korean War. He escaped to Japan, but was heavily persecuted there both as a Korean and a Christian, and eventually immigrated to the US. The church is now largely comprised of Japanese, Koreans, and the people who converted from being preached to in the US. I myself am half Japanese, half Korean, a fact that can only be explained by Moon's bizarre matching methods. A little side note, Moon himself advocated for the mixing of races. I knew many half-white, half-Japanese people and a couple half-black, half-Japanese people as well. This is one of the few liberal ideas that the church maintained and I thought it was kind of interesting. On the flip side, the church hates gay people but they are not especially fanatical about it. 
I was taught to just pretend to be their friends and don't treat them differently. The church also takes part in a lot of missionary work. My Korean mom was born into the church, but my dad converted when he was at college in the States. A white man with a Bible showed up at his door, preached the church's teaching, and my dad decided to check out what they were all about. He later had a moment with God, and, well, here I am. The church is heavily invested in attracting new members. The people who had some extreme views, don't get me wrong. I've sat through three increasingly awkward lectures about the sins of masturbation, but, but in all honesty, the people who I've met who are a part of the church are actually some of the nicest people I've ever met. There's a wholesome attitude that pervades the church and its members. We were taught that we are all part of the same family, that we're all brothers and sisters in our faith. It was actually kind of cool to be able to call each other brothers and sisters. I can't deny that sense of belonging wasn't powerful. It was fun to feel comfortable enough with fellow members to say with earnestness that they were your brother or sister even if they looked vastly different than you and were of a different race than you. In public, there was a general vibe of cooperation and of kinship. At least in the general member population, there was no malice against those that were not a part of the church. It was a more of, they just don't know that they're wrong attitude. I've always maintained that I like the people, just not the beliefs. Something to note about the Unification Church, it owns a whole bunch of businesses that help fund the church via their profits. Up until 2010, they actually owned the newspaper, the Washington Times. Korean cultures pervades the church. Korean food is served oftentimes, Korean culture is taught, and a lot of the words we use to describe church proceedings are in Korean. Most members are Japanese, at least in the US they are. I'm not sure why. The moment when Moon passed was an event, to say the least. I cried. I used to be extremely devout. I used to like the idea of arranged marriage because it took the burden of dating and finding someone off my shoulders. We had a huge scandal when the church's head pastor, who herself was a daughter of Moon, had a baby with the band leader who played worship songs before she gave her sermon every Sunday. Boy, was that a confusing time. I suppose now you can see why, although the church presents a positive image, I have opted to leave at the first available opportunity. It might not seem overtly scary, but trust me, when you realize you have zero control in your life, that it's essentially in the hands of someone else, that's a terrifying thing to realize. Vernon Wayne Howell was born on August 17, 1959 in Houston, Texas. His mother was 14-year-old Bonnie Sue Clark. His father, Bobby Wayne Howell, abandoned the pregnant Bonnie before Vernon was born. Due to the pressures of being a single mother, none of which she was prepared for, Bonnie Sue left the 4-year-old Vernon to be raised by her mother, Earlene Clark. At school, Vernon was a loner. He displayed minor learning difficulties which in turn alienated him from his classmates. He was put in special education classes but dropped out of high school his junior year. It was this confused and unstable upbringing that would characterize the rest of Vernon's life. Howell was 22 when he became a born-again Christian with the Southern Baptist Church. When he found himself harboring desires for his pastor's 15-year-old daughter, he prayed for guidance. He later claimed that while doing so, he opened his Bible at random to Isaiah 34.16. None should want for her mate, it read. He took this as a sign. However, when he approached the pastor with his idea that God wanted him to take his daughter for his bride, the pastor became infuriated and rejected the idea completely. Howell persisted and was eventually asked to leave the congregation. It is this that caused him to leave the central coast of Texas traveling north into rural pastures to join an obscure branch of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. After several years entrenching himself in the small religious community, Howe filed a petition in the California State Superior Court to legally change his name for publicity and business purposes. On August 28, 1990, a judge granted the petition. Howe had legally changed his name to David Koresh. The place he'd moved to several years prior was Waco. The religious movement was named the Branch Davidians. 
David Koresh was warmly welcomed when he arrived at the Mount Carmel compound in 1982. He was young, enthusiastic, and charismatic, forming a band that entertained the Davidians and made him a very popular figure. When the group's prophetic leader died, her son inherited the position of prophet and leader of the commune. However, it wasn't long before Koresh and the newly minted leader began to butt heads. As an attempt to consolidate support for himself and ostracize Koresh, the young leader challenged Koresh to raise the dead, going so far as to exhume a corpse to demonstrate his spiritual supremacy. This was all Koresh needed to topple the arrogant, unhinged young man. He filed charges against him, but was told by Texas prosecutors that evidence of such a crime would be required for an arrest. Soon, the young leader would be arrested and charged with a handful of serious crimes. What's more, since he owed thousands of dollars in unpaid taxes on Mount Carmel Center, Koresh and his followers were able to raise the money and reclaim the property. Koresh had finally cemented his place as the supreme leader of the Waco Branch Davidians. Koresh was the biblical name of the Persian emperor, Cyrus the Great, who was named a messiah for his part in liberating Hebrew slaves from Babylonian captivity. While well, his first name, David, represents his claim to the lineage of King David, of whom the final messiah would be a descendant, by taking the name of David Koresh, he was declaring himself to be a messianic figure carrying out the divinely commissioned errand. Koresh also saw himself as God's hand in setting up a Davidic kingdom in the holy city of Jerusalem in Israel. He believed that would be the place of his inevitable martyrdom. But as early as 1991, Koresh had changed his mind and was convinced that he would be killed as a Christian martyr in none other but the United States. He abandoned the idea of the Jerusalem commune, insisting the prophecies of Daniel would be fulfilled in Waco and Mount Carmel would be the center of the new Davidic kingdom. This is evidence that Koresh was preparing himself for a violent confrontation, years before any such event would occur. Under Koresh's leadership, the Davidians first came to the Texan authorities' attention when accusations of child abuse came to light. The House of David doctrine-led Koresh fathered multiple children by different women in the group. The doctrine was based on a purported revelation that involved the procreation of 24 children by chosen women in the community. These 24 children were to serve as the ruling elders over the millennium after the return of Christ. Koresh's doctrine did indeed lead to marriages with both married and single women in the group, supposedly including at least one underage girl. However, a six-month investigation by the Texas Child Protection Services failed to turn up any evidence. This is possibly down to the Branch Davidians concealing the marriage by assigning a surrogate husband to the girl for the sake of appearances. Ex-members of the Davidians had also claimed that one night, Koresh became irritated with the cries of his son Cyrus. They claimed Koresh physically assaulted the child for several minutes during multiple nightly visits to the child's bedroom. Additionally, a man involved in a custody battle with one of the Davidians visited Mountain Carmel Center and claimed to have seen one of the members physically discipline a child with a large stick. In February of 1993, a local newspaper began publishing a series of articles titled The Sinful Messiah. Researched and written by two journalists, the articles reported on the child abuse that was allegedly occurring on the Mount Carmel compound. In addition to allegations of misconduct, the Sinful Messiah articles claimed that Koresh and his followers were stockpiling illegal weapons. They were based on an interview with a UPS driver that claimed that a poorly sealed package addressed to the Mount Carmel compound had broken open in a sorting office, revealing inert grenade casings and black powder. The articles sent Waco residents into a frenzy. They demanded that something be done about such an obvious danger to the local community. In response to public outcry, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms stepped up to put the situation to bed. And so, Sunday morning, February 28, 1993, the Mount Carmel siege began. Yet, they were worrying signs from the get-go. Despite being fully aware that the Branch Davidians were expecting a raid by federal authorities, the commander of the ATF raiding force ordered that it go ahead anyway. The ATF agents also had their blood type written on their arms and necks while assembling in the staging area, 
This was under recommendation from military advisors since doing so made it easier to find compatible blood for transfusions if an agent was wounded under fire. Before they even made their way to the compound, the ATF were clearly gearing up for a fight. The ATF arrived at the Mount Carmel compound at 9.45 a.m. in a convoy of civilian vehicles. The occupants were uniformed personnel in SWAT-style tactical gear. What happened next is unclear. ATF agents claimed that they had heard shots fired in the compound. While Branch Davidian's survivors assert that the first shots came from the agents at the compound's perimeter, a possible explanation could be that an accidental discharge of an ATF's agent's weapon caused the rest of the team to open fire with their automatic weapons. Another comes from the suggestion that the first shots were fired by ATF agents sent to kill the guard dogs living in the compound's kennels. But regardless of the root cause, everything went to chaos at the Mount Carmel compound. Bullets flew in every direction. Even the three National Guard helicopters being used as a distraction began to take incoming fire. Within minutes, four ATF agents and five Branch Davidians had been killed in the conflagration, with up to 30 wounded on each side. Koresh himself had been wounded in the exchange, with bullet wounds to his hand and torso. The gunfight lasted for 45 minutes until the ATF raiding force began to run out of ammunition, but to their horror, the fire from Mount Carmel refused to slacken. They seemed to possess an almost endless supply. The raid had been a complete disaster. The ATF was forced to retreat from the compound, bloodied and shaken. The deaths of several federal agents was an outrage. Despite ATF attempts to begin latent negotiations with the Davidians, they soon found themselves ousted by the FBI, who took over the case after such a miserable initial display. Their first move was to place the FBI's hostage rescue team in a position to de-escalate the standoff. Soon after, the HRT had managed to negotiate the release of 19 children, securing their safety in case a second violent confrontation broke out. The children were then interviewed by the federal agents and Texas Rangers, who alleged that the children had been physically abused long before the raid began. But the FBI were faced with an additional problem. The Davidians were in telephone contact with local news media, and Koresh gave multiple phone interviews to any outlet or publication that would listen. Additionally, in a videotape made by Koresh and his followers, Koresh introduced his children and his wives to the general public. The video presented the Davidians as peaceful victims of religious persecution, that there was no hostages, that everyone at the compound was staying inside of their own free will. As a result, the FBI were forced to cut off communication to the compound from the outside world. For the next few months, communication with those inside were restricted to a single telephone line directed to a group of 25 FBI negotiators. As the siege wore on, two distinct factions began to emerge within the FBI agents handling it. One group believed that negotiation was the obvious solution. Diplomacy and trust could be used to slowly and steadily diminish the threat posed by the Davidians, until they agreed to peacefully surrender. However, the other group was in agreement that increasingly aggressive techniques were the only way to defeat such a radical religious group. The latter was victorious, and over the following weeks, Various methods of psychological warfare were unleashed upon the compound. In one instance, a set of huge speakers were pointed at the compound, constantly blasting the sounds of jet planes and dying rabbits to deprive the occupants of sleep. While this was happening, the FBI began kind of an arms race as they geared up for the inevitable second assault. Nine Bradley Infantry fighting vehicles and five M728 combat engineer vehicles arrived at the compound and were used to destroy fencing and vehicles owned by the Davidians. Despite their protests, these armored vehicles repeatedly drove over the graves of the Branch Davidians killed during the initial ATF assault. Right when the situation called for a tranquil phasing down of potential violence, both sides chose to continue provoking the other. By this point, it was inevitable that a second violent flare-up was due to occur. On April 19, 1993, the second assault began, this time led by the FBI. 
Attorney General Jeanette Reno, appointed to the position just two months prior by the then-President Bill Clinton, has since stated that the urgency of the assault was down to two reasons. Firstly, up to 30 children still remained on the compound and were apparently still being subjected to child abuse. But secondly, and perhaps most interestingly, was the declaration of solidarity from a woman named Linda Thompson. Linda Thompson had recently declared herself acting adjutant general of the unorganized militia of the United States. She would later announce that the group planned to march on Washington, D.C., where militia men would arrest and try congressional representatives for supposed treason to the Republic. When she learned of the Waco siege, Thompson had allegedly stated that she would organize reinforcements to assist the Davidians in their clash with the federal government. This was extremely worrying since an escalation of the conflict would surely be disastrous and devastating for all involved. The siege had to end, and soon. The assault began with armored engineer vehicles advancing under the cover of agents armed with 50 caliber sniper rifles. Holes were smashed in the walls of the main building so that the armored vehicles could pump increasing amounts of tear gas into the building to force the Davidians to come outside. But the Davidians were tough. Somehow, even with the obscene amount of CS gas being used on them, they took shelter, wore gas masks, and refused to be dislodged from their entrenched positions in the compound. A few hours into the operation, the hostage rescue team had fired so many gas grenades into the building that they began to run out. The grenades they were resupplied with were different varieties that have since been discovered to set fire to the buildings they're fired into. And so, at around noon of that day, three large fires broke out almost simultaneously in different parts of the building, spreading quickly to engulf the complex. Government sources maintained that the fires had been started by the Davidians themselves, but it was no good. Footage of the blaze was broadcast live by television crews directly into living rooms around America. The Davidians had won the propaganda war and were viewed as helpless victims of federal oppression. As a result of the second assault, 76 people died at the Mount Carmel compound on April 19th. The events of the siege spurred a flurry of criminal prosecution and civil litigation. A federal grand jury indicted 12 of the surviving Branch Davidians, charging them with aiding and abetting in the murder of federal officers and unlawful possession and use of various firearms. Eight Branch Davidians were convicted on firearms charges, five convicted of voluntary manslaughter and four were acquitted of all charges. As of July 2007, all Branch Davidians had been released from prison. Nothing remains of the buildings today other than concrete foundation components, as the entire site was bulldozed two weeks after the end of the siege. Only a small chapel which was built years after the siege stands on the site. Koresh is buried at Memorial Park Cemetery, Tyler, Texas, in the Last Supper section, but the man's legacy survived him. It was no coincidence that the Oklahoma City bombing occurred on April 19th. Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols stated repeatedly that the events of the Waco siege motivated them to take action against the federal government. Though the Branch Davidians are now defunct, the desire for belonging that is perhaps the root of all cult-like behavior is something that will continue to plague the U.S. and the world forever. March 20th of 1995 must have seemed like a regular Monday morning for the citizens of Tokyo. As the sun rose over the Japanese capital, almost 14 million people rose from their beds, ate breakfast that mostly consisted of white rice and eggs, then headed off to work. Many of these people would have been reliant on one of the largest and busiest subway systems in the world. The Tokyo Metro's 285 stations provided an essential transport service to almost 9 million Japanese citizens every single day. Yet as the legions of commuters journeyed to their places of employment, some began to feel distinctly unwell. At first, their noses began to run. This would have caused little more than sniffles and thus caused no serious alarm. Commuters simply wiped their nostrils on handkerchiefs or tissues and carried on with their commute. But soon, many found that breathing had become more difficult. Their chests felt tight their breaths more labored, 
Some were having to gasp for air just to stay conscious. Their pupils dilated, becoming large black spots and otherwise deep brown eyes. People began drooling, thick saliva cascading from their lips as a heavy feeling of nausea began to set in. A horrendous smell began to fill the subway carriages as people began to lose their bowels, wet patches forming on their crotches of suit pants, and sufferers began to twitch, their limbs jerking involuntarily as they totally lost control of their bodies. Then... Like dominoes, people began to fall. One by one, they collapsed to the ground in carriages and on platforms, all up and down the Tokyo subway system, and one by one, they suffocated and died where they lay. Witnesses later stated that the subway entrances resembled battlefields. At first, Japanese emergency services had no idea what they were dealing with. Medical staff began to panic hesitating to transport desperately ill people through fear of contamination. One hospital even refused to admit an affected person for almost an entire hour. Over at Shinsu University, Dr. Nobuo Yanagisawa was watching the chaos unfold on live television. At first he thought it was a bombing, but when the deadly attack proved to be bloodless, a morbid curiosity got the better of him. Dr. Yanagisawa began to recognize the sufferer's symptoms as similar to those exposed to the nerve agent Sarin. He had experienced treating Sarin victims after a gas attack in the city of Matsumoto the previous year. He immediately faxed his suspicions to hospitals all over Tokyo. Now the authorities knew what to look for, and they began to build a picture of just what had unfolded that day. They discovered that several packets of liquid sarin had been taken onto various subway trains, then punctured so that the nerve agent would diffuse into the air. Given the confined nature of the Tokyo Metro, this proved devastating. On the day of the attack, ambulances transported almost 700 patients to overwhelm hospitals all over Tokyo, and nearly 5,000 affected people reached hospitals by other means. In total, Hundreds of hospitals treated thousands of patients whose symptoms ranged from mild to fatal. By mid-afternoon, the victims had previously experienced only minor symptoms and had recovered from vision problems and were released from hospital, while the majority of the remaining patients were well enough to go home the following day. Within a week, only a few critical patients remained in hospital, but the death toll on the day of the attack was eight, with four more dying over the following few days. Once Saren was established as the cause of the incident, authorities immediately suspected the group that was believed to be behind the previous attack at Matsumoto. This group was a new religious movement known as Om Shinrikyo. Om Shinrikyo could more accurately be described as a doomsday cult, founded in 1984 by a man named Shoko Ashihara. The cult borrowed beliefs from all manner of mysticism and religions including Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and even the writings of Nostradamus. Despite growing up as somewhat of a bully, Asahara's purported mission was that of a Christ figure, one who could take other people's sins upon himself. He also saw dark conspiracies everywhere he looked and was extremely suspicious of the Freemasons, the Dutch, Jewish people, and even the British royal family. Asahara outlined his doomsday prophecy to his followers, which was based around the idea that an atomic World War III would commence, and described a final conflict culminating in an Armageddon brought about by nuclear bombs, borrowing the term from the Book of Revelation. Asahara often preached the necessity of Armageddon for human relief. He declared that mankind had strayed so far from its creator that true happiness, through lack of sin, would be impossible. After Japanese authorities conducted a carefully planned raid on the cult's headquarters at the foot of Mount Fuji, the full scale of Am Shinrikyo's activities was revealed for the first time. Police found explosives, chemical weapons, and a Russian military helicopter. Police also uncovered stockpiles of chemicals that could be used for producing enough sarin gas to kill 4 million people. Other discoveries included laboratories to manufacture drugs such as LSD, methamphetamine, and a crude form of truth serum, a safe containing millions of US dollars in cash and gold, and detainment cells, many still containing prisoners. During the raids, 
Am issued statements claiming that the chemicals were for fertilizers, but over the next six weeks, almost 200 cult members were arrested for a variety of offenses. The sarin attack, Japan's worst terror incident, killed 13 people and injured thousands more. But there has been a lasting legacy left by the hideous attack. One victim died in 2009 after more than 14 years of hospitalization and treatment. Surveys of the victims in 1998 and 2001 showed that many were still suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. In one survey, 20% of respondents complained that they felt insecure whenever riding a train, while 10% answered that they tried to avoid any nerve attack-related news. Over 60% reported chronic eye strain and said their vision had worsened. Seven members of the Am Shinrikyo Doomsday Cult, which carried out a deadly chemical attack on the Tokyo Underground in 1995, have been executed, including cult leader Shoko Asahara. The executions took place at a Tokyo detention house on Friday, July 6, 2018. Japan does not give prior notice of executions, but they were later confirmed by the Justice Ministry. Their execution by hanging had been postponed until all those convicted had completed their final appeals. Another six members of the cults are still on death row. Injured victims and the families of those killed have welcomed the executions. I react calmly, but I did feel the world has become slightly brighter, said Atsushi Sakahara, a film director. It will be impossible to ever forget the incident but the execution brings a kind of closure. The great philosopher and moralist John Acton once said, Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Never was a truer word said, and never was there a greater example of this than the Reverend Jim Jones. Born in 1931 in rural Indiana, James Warren Jones grew up in the midst of the Great Depression. James was a bright child and a voracious reader, but childhood acquaintances were also quick to note that he was a strange child who harbored an obsession with religion and death. However, Jones had formed an indisputably strong moral compass as a result of his self-education. He once spoke of how his father was connected with the clan, telling of how they had clashed on the issue of race on many occasions. This led to an incident in which Jones's father refused to allow one of his son's African-American friends to enter their home, causing an argument that would ultimately end in divorce and estrangement. In 1951, America was gripped by the Red Scare and the McCarthy witch hunt hearings were in full swing. Jones was outraged by a vision of America that he could not recognize. The land of the three was displaying a blatant intolerance for left-wing ideas, silencing and blacklisting those that attempted to subscribing to them. When he and his mother attended a hearing for musician Paul Robeson, Jones was disgusted when the FBI harassed her at her workplace for her support of Robeson he decided he had to do something about it. Jones later stated that he had asked himself, how can I demonstrate my Marxism? The thought was to infiltrate the church. Even though he was a known communist, a Methodist superintendent helped him to get started and he soon became student pastor at a local Methodist church. But it wasn't long before Jones clashed with the church's leadership when they refused to allow him to integrate African Americans into his congregation. Jones was able to launch his own church following his departure from the Methodists, which had various names until it became the People's Temple Christian Church Full Gospel. By 1960, Jones was now a fully-fledged activist in the civil rights movement. During this time, Jones helped to racially integrate churches, restaurants, a local telephone company, the Indianapolis Police Department, and the Indiana University Health Methodist Hospital. When swastikas were painted on the homes of two black families, Jones walked through the neighborhood comforting local black people and counseled white families not to move. He set up sting operations to catch restaurants refusing to serve black customers and wrote to American Nazi leaders imploring them to renounce their un-American politics. 
When he was accidentally placed in the black ward of a hospital after a collapse in 1961, and he refused to be moved and even began to make the beds and empty the bedpans of black patients. Political pressures resulting from Jones' actions caused hospital officials to desegregate the wards. However, Jones would receive a considerable criticism in Indiana for his integrationist views. White-owned businesses and locals were openly and vocally critical of him. A swastika was placed on the temple, a stick of dynamite was left in a temple coal pile, and a dead cat was thrown at Jones's house after a threatening phone call. It is abundantly clear that during these formative years, the Reverend Jim Jones was not only a charismatic religious leader, but he was an incredibly inspirational and righteous one at that. He was loved and admired by people of all races and backgrounds, but the intense criticism that he faced caused him to be greatly depressed. The assassinations of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X would have been devastating to him, shattering his faith in the idea that the USA could be a kind of political heaven on earth. And so, Jones began to look beyond American shores for places to construct his vision of paradise. By 1977, Jones had established a kind of commune in northern Guyana, on the coast of South America. At its peak, People's Temple Agricultural Project, better known by its informal name of Jonestown, had over 1,200 people living and working together. The commune was held up as a benevolent communist community, with Jones stating, I believe we're the purest communists there are. His wife, Marceline, described Jonestown as dedicated to live for socialism, total economic and racial and social equality. We are here living communally. However, Jones was already displaying increasingly authoritarian tendencies and did not permit members to leave Jonestown without his express prior permission. Jones also carefully controlled any and all information which entered the camp, essentially setting up his own little iron curtain around the Jonestown commune. Jones recorded news readings, constantly broadcasting them over town speakers placed all over the commune. These news readings invariably portrayed the United States as an insidious, imperialist villain, while socialist nations such as North Korea, Zimbabwe, and the USSR were always spoken of in a positive way. But much like the socialist countries which he spoke so glowingly of, food shortages soon became a problem in Jonestown. Community members ate meals that reportedly consisted of nothing more on some days than rice, beans, and the occasional greens and as a result, the community developed some serious medical problems as a result of malnutrition. Jones's vision of heaven was quickly beginning to unravel. In the early evening of November 18, 1978, Jones called all but a handful of the Jonestown residents to the commune's main pavilion. During this meeting, Jones recorded a 44-minute discussion with residents on a small tape recorder, this recording was later to be known as the Death Tape. Readily available to listen to online, the Death Tape includes the moment when Jim Jones first suggests the idea that the residents would be better off if they all ended their lives together in mass. It is truly haunting. Temple member Christine Miller argued that the temple should alternatively attempt an airlift to the Soviet Union. But Jim McIlvain, a former therapist who had arrived in Jonestown only two days earlier, assisted Jones by arguing against Miller's resistance to ending her own life, stating, let's make it a beautiful day. After several exchanges in which Jones argued that a Soviet exodus would not be possible, along with reactions by other Temple members hostile to Miller, she backed down. However, Miller may have ceased dissenting when Jones announced something that shocked the congregation. California Congressman Leo Ryan, who had been visiting the Jonestown commune due to concerns from relatives back in the States, had been murdered at the nearby Port Kaituma airstrip. Jones announced this to his terrified congregation under the pretext that the congressman's murder would be the casus belli the United States needed to finally destroy the Jonestown commune. U.S. officials would order the Guyanese Defense Force to attack the compound, kidnapping their children and ending them all. During this time, the most loyal residents of Jonestown prepared a large metal tub of grape flavor aid, then poisoned the mix with a cocktail of drugs and poisons, namely cyanide. 
At this point, the congregation was surrounded by armed guards. To the Jonestown residents, the situation became clear. Take the poison, or be shot as a traitor to the commune by the men armed with Kalashnikovs. By morning, over 900 people lay dead from poisoning and gunshot wounds in and around the Jonestown compound. Jim Jones himself was found next to his throne-like wicker chair. A gunshot wound to his right temple was consistent with being self-inflicted. Colt Lieutenant Annie Moore's body was found with a note in her hand. In it she had written, Jonestown, the most peaceful, loving community that ever existed. Moore's corpse displayed gunshot wounds that were not self-inflicted. The story of Reverend Jim Jones is fascinating, but it seems to raise more questions than it answers. Just how did a civil rights activist, a person so full of love for his fellow man, end up being the one who ordered and oversaw the death of almost a thousand people? Never was there a clearer example of how good people, with love in their hearts, are also capable of the most heinous acts of evil. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't drink the Flavor Aid.